of John chapter 4, the woman at the well is found one of the attributes of God and it's mentioned in scripture only in this one place specifically. Now, the attribute is referred to in a, or alluded to or you can get the ideal of it in a lot of different passages but as far as it being explicitly directly stated, it's only in this passage of scripture and we're going to read that verse first. John four twenty four. and if you're looking at your bulletin, I have uh, bolded and underlined it's toward the bottom of that back bulletin is what we're going to read first. These are the words of Jesus to the woman at the well. And of course, a truth that is to all of us. But John 4, 24, Jesus says this, God is spirit. Some will say a spirit. The ideal is still the same, that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. And the attribute of God we'll be looking at this morning is the spirituality of God. Now, uh, I've often mentioned that I deal with the young people all the time at the school, and they have sometimes words that they use the same dictionary. That is, they have the same, uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, or they use the same vocabulary, perhaps, but a different dictionary. They use the same vocabulary, words that we would have used, and yet they have different definitions. And I've mentioned it before. It used to be that back when I was in school, and no doubt that most of you were, that when you said something was bad, that meant it was something that was not good, right? Now something that can be that something was bad means it's good. It's kind of changed its meaning. And then if something is really good, you call it sick. When I think of sick, I think I'm not well in some way. And, uh, and then if it's really, really good, they call it wicked. And when I think of something that's wicked, I think of something that is really, really terrible. 
I hear them talking about things too now that say a gangster. And when I think a gangster, I think of somebody I want to stay away from and uh, pray for, certainly, but not necessarily. I don't want to meet him in a back alley uh, where he may have a weapon and I do not, all right? But, but now gangster can even mean something that is good in some form. So there are words that seemingly, they're, they're the same words, but they mean different things. And throughout this course uh, of this message, this series on the attributes of God, we've talked about how people can mean different things even when they say God, can't they? A lot of people use the word God, and yet they can mean different things by it. Some people only use that word even when it's in the course of profanity that would come from their lips. Sometimes people can even use the name Jesus, and they're using even this proper name, Jesus, not just God in general, that any religion might use the word God, just like Christianity does, but some people even use the name Jesus, certainly in profanity instead of in praise, but there's a lot of people that will use the name Jesus in a false religion. Uh, Jehovah's Witness will say that they have a respect for Jesus, but they don't believe that he's God in the flesh and that his suffering on the cross is what pays for your sin. You've got to earn it by your works. The Mormons will say that Jesus is God, but they'll also say that you can be God just like that and you can have your own planet one day and that there was a time when Jesus wasn't and that Jesus is the brother of Satan. How many know they may say that's Jesus, but that's not the biblical Jesus. It's not who Jesus is. Uh, there can be Muslims that will say they have a high regard for Jesus as a moral teacher and even to some effect they might think he was a miracle worker or a prophet of old. But again, they don't believe that he's God in the flesh and that he died on the cross for your sins. How many know words, they need defining, don't they? They need defining. And one of those words certainly that need defining is spirituality. It used to be, uh, some are old enough to remember, you remember when it used to be that people would say, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, but I'm not religious. Anybody ever remember hearing something like that? Maybe you've heard that. And then they would say something like, well, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Anybody heard that sort of phrase? Well, now it's become where the, the, the most common phrase to illustrate a similar idea, although each one of these phrases is kind of on the decline, really, of genuine truth, but they'll say something like, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Or I'm not Christian, I'm spiritual. Anybody ever heard that before? Right? You ask most people, are you spiritual? Like, yes, why? Because they identify. Now, they may have a, the wrong meaning of what that means, but they think of spiritual as being something that means that you recognize that there are things in life that happen. There are things in the world that happen. There are things that happen that we can't wrap quantitative scientific measurements around. In other words, it can't be empirically explained why this happened or this didn't happen or such and such happened in a certain way. Or they might mean spiritual in the sense that they have had some kind of seance or spiritualist who talk to the dead. And how many, that is strictly forbidden in scripture. It's called ne necromancy. It's talking to the dead. It's strictly forbidden. And, 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 and so here it is. There are those who will do that and say, I remember one time I was in a, in a circle of prayer at an outreach one time many, many years ago. And I was in the circle of prayer, and we were having a prayer right beforehand. And some of the people that came to the outreach, we invited them to join in the circle. And they joined in the circle of prayer, and we're there praying. And afterwards, the woman came up to me and says, that felt so spiritual. Since I haven't been that spiritual since I talked to my dead Aunt Lucy at this same time. And I'm like, Lord, I'm begging. <laughs> because what am I going to say to this woman? And, uh, and I won't go into the whole thing, but how do you know people have different ideas of what spirituality is? Right? Spirituality is one of those words that's easy for people to fill with their own meaning and somehow feel good about it. Well, how many know? Not everything that's spiritual, not everything that can be defined, or not everything that escapes defining by natural scientific measurements, it might be quote-unquote spiritual in some form or fashion. But how many know it's, that doesn't mean that it's good? It's the spirituality of God. I don't want to be spiritual in the God kind of way, in the good God-defined kind of way. So we look at this passage of Scripture. I only read one verse. We're going to read through this whole passage of Scripture in parts to look at what the spirituality of God looks like. It won't define it in 
exhaustive way as none of these messages have been exhaustive in their descriptions of various attributes of God. But we're going to look at this passage because I mean, a context of where this happens, especially when it's the only place it's said specifically straightforward like this in Scripture, will tell us what the spirituality of God looks like and would mean. So let's go back to John chapter 4 beginning in verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord, this is Jesus, of course, knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, John the Baptist here, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he, that's Jesus, left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. I like the way the King James says there, he must needs pass through Samaria. Verse 5, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That means it's about noontime. Verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Okay, the first point this morning, and we'll explain it from these first nine verses, is that the spirituality of God means that he doesn't follow the rules. Now, wait just a second. A lot of people like that much of a definition. Right? Spirituality means they don't follow the rules. They can define it however they want to. Spirituality, a lot of people who claim to be Christian, they claim to be super spiritual. In fact, they're so spiritual they don't need to gather with the assembly of the saints on any kind of regular basis because they're too spiritual for that. I, I've seen many people do that. And they, they're spiritual, they're disobedient. Now that doesn't mean that you have, that, that, that there's things that come up and I, I'm never one to crack the whip and say you have to be here with it. But on a regular basis, you ought to be in the fellowship of the saints. Right? There's other people who say, well, I'm so spiritual, I don't need to follow the Word of God because God speaks to me every day. And I just, I just follow exactly what He tells. If you don't have the Word of God, you're hearing voices in the wind. You're not spiritual, you're deceived. Right? You say you're putting it bluntly. Well, hey, I fear if you're here on Super Bowl Sunday, you want to hear it. Somebody says, <laughs> All right? Now, actually, I know Super Bowl Sunday doesn't mean much to, to me. But, <laughs> but at least, well, that, that, uh, that, that, that here this morning, anyway. But uh, and there, there are other people that say, well, I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm so spiritual, uh, none, of the, none of the rules apply. In fact, that's part of the reason people like spirituality or the word spiritual is so they can get away from what they perceive as the rules, right? So when I say spirituality, God means he doesn't follow the rules. I hadn't finished my point yet. It means he doesn't follow the rules of men. And when we're here, you say, how do you get that from these first few verses? Well, it's because of this. Some of you are familiar with this. Jesus is passing from Judea. If you look in the book of maps at the end of your Bible, all right, you look where Judea is and you look where Samaria is. Judea is in the south. And so, let's say this is Judea here. Then the north, back where the exit sign is and where you came in at, let's say that would be, uh, that would be Galilee. It's in the north. And if you look at your Bible, it looks like if you wanted to go from the front of the church, that's Judea, to the back of the church, to Samaria, that you would go straight, just a straight path from one to the other. But if you look between those two places, between Judea in the south and Galilee in the north, is a land called Samaria. And what would happen is, if you were a Jew, especially if you were a religious Jew, and especially if you were a rabbi, a teacher in the Jewish religion, a self-respecting Jew that was that followed after the traditions of the rabbis. When you wanted to go from Judea up to uh, Galilee, you wouldn't take the straight shot. You would go across the river. You go over to the right, over to the uh, uh, over to the, the, the east, and you would go through a land known as Perea, and then you come back over the other way. Kind of be like instead of going down the red carpet here, you take the route I tell Beansy to go whenever I've just vacuumed the floor. <laughs> go around on the go around on the hard floor. And and not go across the not go across the carpet. You wouldn't take the straight shot. And why would they do that? Even though it meant an extra journey for them, it meant extra labors for them. A, a Jewish rabbi, religious person, would not go through the region of Samaria because Samaria was viewed as an unclean land, filled with an unclean people. 
And I won't go into all the history of it, but Samaria, the Samaritans, okay? If you've read your New Testament, you've heard the word Samaritans. Jesus would use that in his teaching many times. What's what I call the parable to the bad lawyer, but it's usually called the parable of the good Samaritan, right? You've heard that. Jesus said uh, in Acts 1 8 that Samaria was one of the places the gospel was to be sure and go to, right? And Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even though the most parts of there. Acts chapter 8, Philip will go to Samaria and bring the gospel, and the other uh, the apostles will come there and, and, and sit there, seal to it afterwards there in Acts chapter 8. So Samaria, Samaritans are mentioned in Scripture. But the Samaritan, the Samaritans of Jesus' day, the reason why the Jewish folks viewed them as unclean people is because when Assyria came, you remember there's 12 tribes, right? 12 tribes of Israel. The northern uh, nation called uh, Samaria, okay, called Israel, was the, when, the, when there was a civil war and they broke into 10 in the north and 2 in the south. The ten tribes in the north, when they were conquered by Assyria, Assyria sent other people groups in there. And they intermarried with the Jews that did remain in that area. And they basically made up uh, false religion and it had eclectic elements to it. And they only accepted the first five books of the Bible. And Moses was the preeminent one. And they said Mount Gerizim, which will come out later, a certain mountain was where you were supposed to worship. They even built a temple there. But it was destroyed about 200 years before Christ. There's still a group of Samaritans today that follow after this Mount Gerizim. A little small group of Samaritans that live there today and still follow this uh, false religion that, that only views the first five books and disregards the rest. And they don't put trust in Christ. These sorts of things. So this group of Samaritans was looked upon as impure by the pure Jews of the day. And they had no dealings with one another again. Most of them would not even go through the land. They'd take an extra measure to avoid that land. Now, you won't find it in Scripture where it's commanded that you avoid the region of Samaria. But that was a man-made rule. How many know Jesus had something about... Uh, Jesus broke their man-made traditions all the time. Especially when it came to healing on the Sabbath. He would go and heal on the Sabbath. And they'd say, you're breaking the Sabbath. They couldn't show him chapter and verse. If you can't show chapter and verse, well, then, uh, you know, uh, you don't maybe need to take it quite as seriously. But there was a chapter and verse where it was that they could say, Jesus, you can't heal on the Sabbath. But they would convict him and condemn him by their own tradition. And Jesus would say, you're elevating your tradition above the law of God. And how many know elevating man's words above God's words, that's not good spirituality. And here it is, Jesus, he would break those man-made rules because... He, not that he broke God's rules, he never did. How many are thankful he didn't? If he broke God's rules, he couldn't be our redeemer. But he didn't, he, he put God's word above man's word. And we need, to, we need to know that. You know, scripture tells us we're to follow the laws of the land unless they break the laws of God. God's laws are the highest laws for the believer. And I will say that perhaps could increasingly become an issue even here in, in our nation as it is in many places around the world. But at any rate, Jesus, he didn't follow man's will. He went through this region of Samaria, even at the risk of being looked down upon by the uppity religious folks of the day, because he was truly spiritual. He was going to follow the will of his father. He said he did nothing and said nothing unless it was from his father. And it said, again, I like the way King James puts it, he must needs pass through Samaria. There was a divine appointment that day. And he not only went through this region of an outcast people, of people looked down upon, but he asked this woman for a drink of water. Now, I will tell you, back in that day, getting water for the family was women's work, and it was tough work. There are places, even in our day and age, where it is the women who will go to the well, and they'll have to get enough water in this big jar, and they place it on their heads. Some of you may have seen that in pictures, or maybe you've been to foreign lands and seen that. And that's the water that their family needs for the day, for the washing of hands, for the cooking, for whatever goes on with water. They go there and they get it on a daily basis. It's very heavy, a very arduous task to do. And so wells are very places where a lot of women will be. In fact, if you look throughout the Old Testament, it was kind of a motif. Um, uh, in other words, a recurring theme that... Uh, brides were found at wells. And that's an issue for another day, but because that's where a lot of ladies would be, because that was women's work. And so this woman is there to get water from this well that's 120 feet deep. That's about 10 to 12 stories. 
the Canyon Bluff. It's 120 feet deep. And she has to get that water from down there and pull it up and put it in the water pot that she has there to collect the water that she needs and the household to which she is going to need. It's a very hard duty. And it was not, um, it was not a, a, a uncommon for someone to come by and ask a woman that was getting water from a well to say, could you give me a, a, a little drink of water? But what was uncommon is for a Jew to ask a Samaritan woman for a cup of water. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. This woman points it out to him. And so here it is, is that, that it, it, she would have, now we get no uh, confirmation here that she actually gave Jesus that drink of water. We don't know if sure she did or not. But Jesus certainly would have accepted it because he asked for it. And so here it is. It was in a vessel that she had handled, in a cup that she had handled, in a region in which she lived. And as we read through the story, most of you know, she wasn't just an outcast group of people. She was an outcast of the outcast because she was even a, a seen as a sinner amongst them. And yet Jesus comes there to bring to her the gospel message of who he is, confronts her with her sin as we go through the the story this morning, you'll see that. Many of you will be aware of it already. But the spirituality of God means that you don't follow the rules of men, but you do follow the rules of God. Look here next. Look at verse 9. Uh, verse 10. I'm, I'm sorry, we'll pick up at verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give to him... Uh, will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. The second point about the spirituality of God means this. Is this. The spirituality of God means that he speaks of things beyond the natural. Now they might be linked to the natural or they might be illustrated by the natural. But they're beyond just what we can see and perceive in the natural. This woman says, why do you ask me for water since you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan? And Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God who was standing before you, you'd ask me and I'd give you living water and you'd never thirst again. And the woman says, are you greater than our father Jacob? And, 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 and Jesus says to her, you'll never thirst again if you have this water. She says, well, then let me have this water because I, that way I don't have to come here to draw. Now, a lot of people will say, a lot of scholars will say, they'll say that uh, this woman... She's only concerned with natural water. And indeed, I don't think she's concerned about supernatural anything here. I think she is concerned about natural water. I think she's a little sarcastic, though, because it don't take a rocket surgeon to figure out. To figure out that, uh, that what it is, that there's no kind of water, natural water resource, that you go to and you'll never thirst again. How many know you can go back there today and get a... Uh, 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 cup of water from the water cooler, by the time you get home, you'll want to drink something again, won't you? Right? You can go and get a bottle of water out of the fridge next door, but later on in the day, you're going to want some more. Right? How many know? You have never drank of a natural water source. You might drink of some water that's better than other. I tell you, I drink a lot of water. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I need to be healthier in all of my habits, but I do drink a lot of water. My favorite, and, and I never thought back in the day when the water I drank was Pepsi water. <laughs> Anybody drank Pepsi water? Anybody drank Coca-Cola water? I'm praying for you. But, <laughs> but I'm kidding. But at any rate, it, it's, back in the day, I never thought I would, I, I, would, I would ever drink water. And like I do now, because water is most of what I drink. And I didn't think you could probably tell too much of difference. Water is water is water. But how do you know? Water is not water is not water. Now, I've never been to a foreign country. I know some foreign countries, they'll say, don't drink the water because it might have various uh, things in it, contaminants and taste a certain kind of way. So I've never had that kind of water. But I, you can tell water. My favorite water is the water that comes out of our fridge with ice in it. 
and then you let the ice melt just a little bit in there so it becomes really cold water. Now, I can tell you, that's, that's the water I like the best. My second favorite kind of water is Aquafina. <laughs> and then after Aquafina, there's the kind of water you, you can get from either a, a Sam's or Costco or BJ's. And that water pretty much tastes all the, all the same to me. And, and, and the reason why I like it especially, too, is because... It's priced right, and price makes things taste better. Frugality is a Christian word. But I have never, whether it's a good taste in water or not a good taste in water, I have never had any kind of water where I thought I'm not going to need any more tomorrow. That I thought that this water would quench my thirst forever. So Jesus moves from the natural to the spiritual. And I don't know that this woman thinks he's getting spiritual. Or she thinks he's out of his mind. But she does not. I don't think she thinks he's got some secret. Where she never has to have water. For her natural needs again. I don't think she thinks that. I think she's maybe being a little sarcastic. There. Well, Teach me where, where I get this water. So I don't have to come here and do this hard labor anymore. And by the way. She was doing extra hard labor. She was at a well at the sixth hour. Remember she said at noon time? And she's in the middle of the day in a desert region getting water, which a lot of women would do, but they would come earlier in the day or later in the day when it was cooler. They didn't want to be there at noon. Why is this woman there at noon? Well, because she's got a past that she don't want to talk to nobody about. And the well is a place where gossip passes too, uh, uh, because that's part of the, it would make it a little easier on the women. They came there to get this hard work, get this water, but at least they got the shoot the breeze and share the gossip for a while. But she didn't want to be a part of that. Why? Not because she was necessarily against gossip. It's just the gossip would be a lot about her. And she didn't want to be a part of that. So she's there in the hottest part of the day. She would like to not have to do that work anymore, but I don't think she really thinks that's going to be a reality. She doesn't realize that Jesus is moving from the natural to the spiritual. But how many like to do that, if, especially if the door opens in conversations you have with people? To move from the natural to the spiritual. I heard uh, uh, Brother Michael Ponziano here two or three months ago. He was sharing the gospel with someone outside of where we were passing out the meal. And he said some. I won't get the exact words right. But he said, this is a natural meal and we're glad to provide it. Pray it's a blessing for you. But uh, you're, you're going you're gonna to get hungry again. No matter how good it is, you're going to get hungry again. But there is the bread of life. That is Jesus that if you partake of him, you'll never hunger again. Moving from the natural to the spiritual. I mean, oh, God does that a lot in Scripture. Moving from the natural to the spiritual. This ideal of water, by the way. If you look back in the Old Testament, you will see that in Ezekiel 47, the water that Ezekiel sees in a vision coming from God. And it brings life everywhere it goes. How many know the water that... Uh, sometimes water is necessary for our life, but if you get too much of it, I don't know, it can bring destruction. Anybody remember Ian? <laughs> right? But there is water that's the water of life, and aren't you thankful that's a well that will never run dry, and that is the well that is Jesus. We come to John, or back in the book of Isaiah, it'll talk about uh, uh, God as being the fountain of living waters. The book of Revelation talks about, in heaven, the voice of many Waters. Jesus in John chapter 6, he says he is the living water. And those that partake of him will never thirst and never hunger again. Why? Because he is the one that will fulfill righteousness. And that's what fills up the righteous meter. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness as he mentioned in his parables. How many are thankful Jesus, the spirituality of God, means he moves from the natural to the spiritual. God certainly provides our natural needs. But aren't you so thankful he meets our spiritual needs? He is the fountain of living water. Those who come unto him shall never thirst again. There's a song. In fact, we might sing it before too long. It's an old song called There is a River. And the second verse talks about the woman at the well. It says there was a thirsty woman. She was drawing from the well. Her life was ruined and wasted and her soul was bound for hell. But then she met the master and he told her of her sin. And he said, if you'll drink this water, you'll never thirst again. How many are thankful? That promise is still real today. Here we are next. So, point one, the spirituality of God means he doesn't follow the rules of man. Point two, the spirituality of God means that he speaks of things beyond the natural. 
Point number three, look at verse 16. Jesus said to this woman, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now, remember, point one was the spirituality of God means he doesn't follow the rules of man. Well, here's point number three. The spirituality of God means that he does take sin seriously. Again, a lot of reason people like to talk about spirituality in our day and age is so they get away from any kind of what they perceive as rules. Any kind of what they perceive as of condemnation. Any kind of what they perceive as judgment. Don't judge me. Now, they'll judge you for judging them, but that's okay. They're the ones doing the judging. All right? And there's, there's such irony there, all right, is they'll say, well, don't judge me, but I'm judging you for judging. So they're, ju they're doing, you're not telling them not to judge. They're telling you not to judge, and then they're doing the very thing they're telling you not to do, all right? And they don't realize that, but it's just, it's very ironic, okay? You didn't say they couldn't judge, so you're not putting that on them, but they tell you not to judge. Well, they're ju the very, well, if they tell you something to do, they're, they're judging you. If they tell you something not to do, they're judging you. They're convicted, but their, their worldview can't even make sense or hold together if they really think about it. But too often they don't really think about it. But lots of people like spirituality because spirituality means that sin is defined into oblivion. But the spirituality of God takes sin seriously. And what does Jesus do? He brings up this woman's sin. He says, you've had five husbands. And now the husband that you're, the, the man that you're with, and even your husband. And he said, and that, that sin brings up this sin. Spirituality of God takes sin seriously. Some people say, well, Jesus is being mean here. He's bringing up sin. Why does he bring up sin? He brings up sin not only because the spirituality of God means he takes sin seriously, but the spirituality of God means he wants to point her to salvation. And unless there's repentance from sin and faith in Christ, there can be no salvation. The people that say that there's no sin, there's only... And, and we use all kinds of mistakes, mistakes, indiscretions, but you know what word we use in the, in the school system now? It's bad choices. We don't tell the kids, do what's right. We say, make good choices. When the kids do wrong, we don't say, you broke the rule. We say, you made some bad choices. <laughs> you made a bad... Uh, but listen, there are good choices or bad choices, and I guess there's some meaning to be meant from that. But I will tell you, there is something about the scriptural view. This is right. And this is wrong. And when there's something that's wrong, we need to be convicted of it, repent of it, and put our trust in the only one in whom there's salvation, which is Jesus. Amen. Spirituality of God does not dismiss sin. Takes sin very seriously. Why? Again, a lot of people, you know why they like spirituality? Again, they define sin into living. And a lot of people that talk about spirituality, they separate the spirit from what they do in the flesh and in the natural they say there's no connection between the two. I will tell you, if you look in Scripture, when it is that we sin, we are justly condemned for our sin of lying, of cheating, of putting our, our hope in false gods, in false religions, of coveting, of murder, adultery, all the things mentioned in the God's Ten Commandments, and for not putting faith in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and pride, all these other, the sins that we've committed in the flesh, and don't you know they have impact upon spiritual eternity and here it is jesus says the spirituality of god takes sin seriously is he wanting to just condemn her is he wanting to say ha, ha, i gotcha some people view god that way you know you remember the old song uh, oh be careful little hands what you do or eyes what you see or ears what you hear you remember that little song Sunday school song they said for the father above he is looking down in love Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. A good sermon, really. Some people view that and say, Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father above, He will squash you like a bug. Oh, be careful. <laughs> and some people think God's like that. God, it's His will, it's His desire that all will come to repentance and that none should perish. Those who perish have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and they have loved the darkness rather than the light 
and they choose to continue in their sin instead of being forgiven and through repentance from sin and faith in Christ. It's not that God wants to bring the hammer down like that, but it is that He brings up sin. And why bring up sin? Because with part from repentance from sin, there will be no acceptance of salvation. This woman, this woman her sin is brought before her. Spirituality takes sin seriously. I tell you, a person who doesn't take sin seriously can claim to be spiritual all they want, and they're not spiritual, they're just disobedient. Just like all these other things I mentioned earlier. They can claim to be spiritual all they want, but if they're not regularly in a group of believers, they're not spiritual, they're just disobedient. They can claim to hear from God all they want, but if they're not in God's Word, they're not spiritual, they're just deceived and likely don't even know it. So here it is, look next. Now look at verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem. I tell you, anytime you hear the words you people, you know you're talking to somebody that, right? It says, you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Now, point four. The spirituality of God means that he tells the truth and confronts error. Notice, Jesus, after he tells her of her sin. What, what is it? In fact, I love that old song. It says, then she met the master and he told her of her sin. And then he said, if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. Those are good lines. And here it is in this story of John chapter 4, Jesus meeting this woman at the well. He confronts her about her sin. And what does she do? She doesn't deny it. The first words out of her mouth are, well, who are you to tell me? But the first words out of her mouth are, well, no, I didn't do that. You say, well, that would be a lie. She thought people lie all the time. I mentioned last week on the truthfulness of God message. I can't tell you how many students I'll tell them, quit talking in class. And they'll say, but I wasn't talking. I was just saying. <laughs> the difference is what? <laughs> right? Uh, people lie all the time. She didn't lie. She didn't try to cover it up. She didn't say, well, you talking to me? Who are you? She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Whatever she thought about his offer of water that she'd never thirst again, she either thought him spiritual or she thought him to be insane in some way. How could one say such a thing? Now she knows there's something about this fella. Her estimation of him now isn't that he's just a Jew and her a Samaritan. Her estimation of him now isn't just that he talks about living water and that I don't know whether to take it serious or pie in the sky foolishness. Her, no. Now she... He, she at least recognizes him as a prophet. Now, look at when we think about prophet, even when the world, apart from Christianity, thinks about a person they might call a prophet, you know what they think about? And you know what many Christians think about? Is a person that tells, uh, foretells the future. And a person that, that, that uh, uh, is do 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 in some way, right? The old Twilight Zone music, right? That's what they think of many times when they think about a prophet. Someone who foretells the future. Someone who sees demons everywhere. Whatever it might be. That's how many think about a prophet. But notice, has G Jesus does know information here that there's no way he could know apart from some kind of divine source. Right? Now obviously he's God in the flesh and we know that. She doesn't know that. We, look, we as believers know that. But she knows he didn't get, he's not from around here. He's not from our country. Jews don't even come through here. He had no way to know this unless there's some kind of divine origin for him to know this information. She says, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. And you know, to be a prophet does mean to know something that has something of which there's divine origin for. But I will tell you, to be a prophet doesn't so much mean to be like this or to foretell the future. Being a prophet means you tell the truth. You look at the Old Testament. Did the prophets foretell what was going to happen? Oh yeah, they could do that when God would give them in such a way. But they were also known for telling the truth in their time about sin to the people that the people oftentimes in that time would reject. 
A prophet, you know, John the Baptist is the greatest prophet who ever lived. Jesus said it himself. And as far as we know, what's recorded in scripture, there's no recorded miracle that he performed of healing us. I don't know that he didn't, but that God didn't use him in that way. We don't have that recorded. We don't have it recorded where he went and said, this is going to happen to this particular person at this particular time. Some kind of like knowing the future in advance sort of thing. But what did he do? He told the truth. He told the truth to Herod. He told the truth to Herodias. He told the truth to the religious leaders. Truth that they didn't want to hear. How many know spirituality means somebody tells the truth? And it comes from divine origin. You say, well, how do they get that? Well, could God certainly drop a word of knowledge or wisdom to someone? Most well, certainly he could. But I will tell you, if you're, how many are holding a Bible there? I hope close at home anyway. I know maybe you know I'm going to put it in the bulletin so you might not have. But I hope that you partake of this Bible here on a regular basis. Or, well, your Bible. <laughs> right? How many know this is a divine origin? And a person who knows it and proclaims it in a sense of the word. Again, there's much more that could be filled out the definition of that word. But a prophet, somebody who proclaims the word of the living God. How do you want to proclaim that which is of divine origin, the truth? Spirituality means somebody tells the truth and confronts error. What did this man, what did Jesus do? He said this. Remember I told you the Samaritans, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible. They didn't worship God in truth. They thought Mount Gerizim was the place they were supposed to worship. And they looked down upon the Jews. What is it? Jesus doesn't mince words. He says, you people worship what you don't know. You're a false religion. You're following after a false God. He says, we worship what we know for salvation is of the Jews. Jesus didn't say all religions are equal. And listen, somebody that's of another religion, it doesn't mean that we look down upon them and we squat. But it does mean this. If you're a believer and you believe in the Bible, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. You want to proclaim to everyone there's a way of salvation and that way is only Jesus. And here it is, is that He didn't mention what, dare I say, He even corrected it. Remember, people don't like to be called religionists. They don't like to be, they say, I want relationship, not religion. Well, there's a truth there. We don't want just dry laws, so to speak. How many know? If you follow after Jesus, it's more than just religion. It is a relationship with Christ. But you know the root word of religion. And James talks about pure and undefiled religion. L-I-G. Same word there from which we get the word ligament. It's what holds things together. It's truths that hold things together. Dare I say Jesus even got involved in a religious dispute. And what did he say? He says, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know for salvation is of the Jews. He spoke the truth and he confronted error. And how many know that's spiritual? That's spiritual. What? If he left her in her error, would she be saved? No. He cares. See, this spirituality isn't just when I talk about caring to tell the truth and these sorts of things. It's not in what the, and confronting with her sin. It's not so he can play whack a mole on her every day. It's because he wants her to be saved. And how many thank you? He wants her to be saved. He's going to be to die for her salvation. In fact, I won't go too much into this, but I will say, remember how I told you that it was, it's, you go, go, just study the Old Testament, you'll find it's a motif. It happens over and over again. People go to the well to find the wife. Go to the well to find the wife. How many know believers in Christ are called the bride of Christ? Mm -hmm. Jesus went to the well and in part found, found the bride. Wanted to put their trust in him, Right? Now, that's not his only bride. I don't mean it that way. But how many know there's a beautiful picture there? He went to the well, and here's someone that's going to believe in him, become part of the bride of Christ. Now, look here next. He, he not only, he, he, he confronted her error, he got, and he told her the truth. That's spiritual. Now, look next. We ended up in verse 22. Now, look at verse 23. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. For such people, the father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you. And he now 
The last point, point number five of this message is this. The spirituality of God means that he cannot be contained on a mountain or anywhere else. Notice he said, you say worship to Mount Gerizim, he told her, you're wrong. Your way of looking at things, the false religion you've been brought up with is wrong. But then he said salvation is of the Jews, and indeed it was. How I many know Jesus, according to the flesh, was of Jewish ancestry? Also, the, 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 the people that believed in all the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, Malachi, I do know it's Malachi, I said Malachi the other morning, and I said, eh, probably so far. I do know it's Malachi, all right, but that have the Old Testament, and by the way, I will say, there's lots that can be said on the canonicity of Scripture, in other words, how we determine what books are to be in Scripture. By the time of Jesus, Genesis to Malachi was seen as the Jewish, they would view it as the Word of God, we say, of course, the Old Testament, that was already in play. If Jesus would have wanted to come and change that, he sure could have said, well, take this book out, put this. He didn't do that. Jesus is kind of the, the personal uh, seal, if you will, to say that's Old Testament scripture right there, Genesis to Malachi. And so Genesis to Malachi, all of those Old Testament books, what did they do? They spoke of Christ who was to come. And so here it is, is that the whole system, not just not just Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans had a temple a couple hundred years before Christ and been torn down. But how many know the very temple there in Jerusalem, Jesus said it was going to be torn down. And indeed it was in 70 AD. It was torn down. Not one stone left on top of another. The Jewish temple was getting ready to come down. The, the, the sacrificial system was getting ready to come down. The priesthood itself getting ready to come. Why? Because all of those things, even though prescribed in the Old Testament... They were meant to point to Christ who was to come, not to, to say that this, that this, how many know God was in the temple, God was especially in the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, but could that box, could that temple contain God? God said, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What did he mean by that? By the way, he didn't literally mean there that he had feet, all right? But he means that, what is it? He is so, notice, his transcendence, his above and beyondness, his Bigness, if you will, is beyond being contained by any human uh, building or strategy or plan. How many are thankful for that? God is above and beyond. In fact, God, and, and, and hear me out on this, uh, this will take a little bit of unpacking, but part of the reason why there was a prohibition, that means a rule against making any graven image, is because there's no graven image that could accurately depict who God was because God is spirit. He said, you don't make any graven images. Don't worship these false idols. And that's what the pagan peoples did all the time, right? They made these false idols. In fact, God, in a sense, you know, in the Old Testament, talks about the eyes of the Lord being upon you or the hand of the Lord moving on your behalf. Or it talks about the voice of the Lord speaking to you. All of these are what we call anthropomorphisms. And that comes from the root word for man. It means that it's God relating himself in a way that we can understand. But does that literally mean that he's got this physical hand or this? He, God is spirit. And some will say, and, and so he really can't be contained. Now, in the incarnation, Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, he is fully divine and also fully human. And when you see, if you were there to see Jesus, you would see God in the flesh. Colossians says in him, but the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, Jesus fully human, fully God to be sure. But how many know the incarnation was an addition to him? It was not a subtraction. He still filled all things. Had he ceased filling all things, the whole world, I don't know, would explode, implode, glowed somehow. It just glowed. All right? So God cannot be con 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 contained. God is, is spirit. That means that he, he is uh, big is not even the right word for it. I tell you, heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool, one house would be. The implication is he cannot be contained. All of these Old Testament systems, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, the tabernacle, the temple, they were going to pass away. Why? Because who were they pointing to? They were pointing to Jesus who would fulfill it all. And how does this story end? Now, I didn't tell you all the story. If you read there, the woman goes back to these same people she tried to avoid and shares the gospel with them. How I many know that's what a genuine believer wants to do? And that's what she does. She goes back and says, hey, come see a man who told me all the things ever I did. They come to Jesus. And there's revival there in Samaria. How I many know God, I, I tell you, God is great. You won't pick a place to have revival. You probably won't pick Samaria. But God, again, yeah, he doesn't follow the rules of man, right? 
follows his, his ways. But Jesus, what does he do? This woman now, she thought that he was, she knew he was a Jew at first. She might have thought him a little crazy when he talks about water, you'll never thirst again. Talks to her about her sin, knows he's a prophet. Now she says, hey, I know the Christ, when he's coming, he's going to tell us all things. And what does Jesus say? I'm not just a Jew. I'm not a crazy man. I'm not just a prophet. He says, I who speak to you and he. How many know there is no greater spirituality than to come to know Christ? And to want to glorify Christ. I will tell you, a lot of people that claim to be spiritual, sometimes they do these various machinations to glorify themselves. God can do all sorts of things. And I know that, that to find our human explanation, but do understand this, is to be done for His glory. Said for His glory. To point people to Christ. What is it that Jesus says to her? He says, I who speak to you am or He. I am. I am He. I am the I am. Jesus saying to her, I am, I am Christ. Now, how many have ever read through the Gospels and noticed Jesus, he didn't go around just saying that straight up a lot, right? I mean, he would do things. He would say, the works testify of who I am. My words testify of who I am. The Father testifies of who I am. I've done no sin. That testifies of who I am. John the Baptist testifies of who I am. But seldom did he come up to people and say, I'm the Christ. I'm the Christ. I'm the Seldom did he. In fact, sometimes there were demons that would show up in service and they had a better confession of who Jesus is than, than a lot of people do. He said, you're the most high God. And he would tell them, quiet, hush, right? He wouldn't let them, let, let them speak. But here, who does Jesus reveal himself to? This Samaritan woman from an outcast people, an outcast demon amongst the outcasts. And he comes to her and says, I who speak to you and he. How do we know her day got changed. <laughs> she, I tell you, she made me thought about going to the Super Bowl or the Mardi Gras, or in her case, just to the well, well water. But how many know that day ended up a lot different than what she thought it was going to be at the beginning? Why? Because the word came to her. Spirituality came to her. Not some false worldly spirituality that says, if it feels good, do it. If you're emotional about it, do it. No, some genuine spirituality that doesn't fall the dictates of men, but does follow the rules of God. That takes sin seriously, to be sure. But that offers things that are genuinely spiritual, like the living water, instead of just things of the natural. That offers to her and comes and says, that offers her the truth about religion and about things of the spirit. And then tells her ultimately, I who speak to you am he. How many are thankful she became a genuine believer that day? She goes and she tells others, come see someone, come to Christ. And listen, spirituality, genuine spirituality wants to bring others to Christ, to the truth. Now I'll close with this. Notice Jesus said here. Go back to our verse. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and what? The spirituality of God. There are a lot of people, again, even people that profess Christianity, maybe even some folks that are genuine Christians, just we, we all, I mean, all of us have a growth curve to be certain. But they think that genuine worship means when I really feel it. Really feel it. When the singer hits the right note or the guitar hits the right chord, it just hits me in the right way. Pow, that's worship. If I go there and we just sing, how great thou art, how great thou art. If I, we just go and sing and I don't feel nothing, well, that ain't genuine worship. Worship in spirit and in truth. Now, I will tell you, God will involve every single part of us. Just like I said, the spirituality of God means that he can't be contained. That means his worship can't be contained. I will tell you, there is something inside of the genuine believer that there are times when you're worshiping God that you just want to. Anyone ever had it where your voice just can't get loud enough? Your hands can't get high enough? You can't stay long enough? Why? Because you just want to worship God. Amen. But I will tell you, it doesn't always happen that way. And even if it does happen that way, there are people that feel that way about lies. Now, not in the, not in the true way, but they, they feel very emotional and they could say amen to what I just said. But they're worshiping a Jesus that they command instead of one who commands them. 
They're worshiping a Jesus that, 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 that didn't die on the cross for their sins. They're, they're, they're worshiping some uh, God that is more like their bellboy than their master. How many know that it's not just in spirit insofar as spirit just doesn't mean emotional, although it can involve emotions. But how many are thankful it involves truth? Truth of who God is, our blessed Redeemer. Truth that because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Truth that He died to seal my pardon. Truth that in this life we have trouble, but one day, by and by, we're going to understand it. I'm on purpose picking out songs that we sing this morning. Truth that He is my Jesus, my Savior, because I needed a Savior. I was a sinner. How many are thankful, Spirit, and in truth? The worship of God can't be contained. That means it goes beyond this building and out into every area of the believer's life. Because we're his temple now, he says, collectively and individually. True spirituality means that and true worship would mean that we don't follow the dictates of men. But we follow, do follow the dictates of God. That we take sin seriously. That we want to point people to spiritual and eternal things. How many here want to worship God who is spirit and worship him in spirit? Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we come before you. We thank you indeed. This world has all kinds of definitions of what spirituality means. And as they do with all kinds of words, they fashion it to their own making rather than following a biblical definition. Well, the word of God is the truth and we get our definitions from it. And this, John chapter 4, the only place where... This is specifically mentioned. The ideal certainly is found in other places, but specifically said, God is spirit. Those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. We study this passage. We get the context. We see what genuine, true spirituality of God looks like and what to worship God in spirit and in truth looks like and entails. Lord, this morning, if there is anyone who, like this woman at the well, has not yet, at the beginning of this passage anyway, she had not repented of sin and put trust in Christ. But she did by the end. Jesus confronted her of her sin, and Jesus told her of the truth where salvation was found. And he told her about the falseness of any other belief. And if there's anyone here this morning that's not put genuine trust in Christ and not repented of sin, I pray they come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children, while they're of recent or many years, even decades of life, I pray, and I know it's the prayer of every genuine believer, that we would praise you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we, we, we just, we know that, that those who are believers who bled and died on the cross for our sins and filled us with your spirit. And we want to worship you with all that we have and all that we are for all of our days. And even beyond, for as another old song says, when we've been there 10,000 years, we'll no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Lord, we pray that we will praise you and worship you and be spiritual in the right sense of the terms. To follow after God and not men. To take sin seriously. To talk about genuine spiritual things and not just things of the natural. To point to and want to glorify Christ. And to not let our worship of you be contained simply within the walls of this place. But that we would praise and worship you with our heart, life, mind, soul, and strength each and every day. Lord, that is our prayer. May you be glorified, O Lord, above the heavens and your glory be over all the earth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the power of the Spirit, we come. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is a hope of your calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of his power extend to all who believe. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you today in Jesus' name.